So we left off on the null space here, and we discussed why the null space should have one dimension. So we're going to now find the null space, and it's going to be the solution to the algebra problem AX equals zero. So if we write this out in matrix form, Let's figure out the dimensions everything needs to be. We have a three by three matrix. So we need our inner dimensions to match. So this needs to be a three by something. And this is a vector here. So the something is one to make it a vector. And then our product will be the outer dimensions, three by one. So this is just looking at the dimensions right here. <clears throat> so our zero vector is zero, zero, zero. And we could write x1, x2, x3 as our uh, variables we're trying to find here. Well, maybe I should leave those up. So let's go ahead and multiply across and down like we usually do on matrices here. So we got 3x1 minus 1x2 plus 5x3 equals zero, negative one x one plus one x two plus three x three equals zero, and five x one minus five x two plus one x three equals zero. So we've seen this correspondence before between a matrix product or matrix equation at the top and then linear equations or system of linear equations at the bottom. So we've seen this before, but this is just going over it again one more time. So we can set up our augmented matrix. So our matrix will be 3, negative 1, 5, 0, negative 1, 1, 3, 0, 5, negative 5, 1, 0. And I told you you could be lazy, and when it's augmented with zeros, you could skip writing those zeros on the right and just do a vertical bar on the right side. All right, so we're going to reduce this matrix and find the null space. So go ahead and do that right now. I think we may have a problem here. We're supposed to have one free variable and I'm not seeing a free variable. Oh, I wrote down the wrong matrix. That's why I don't see a free variable. Oh, all right. We're supposed to use the matrix we were using before. So let's reset everything. All right, so I knew we had the wrong matrix because you can see no free variables are gonna occur right here. 
So I was expecting one. That was my spidey sense right there. So what happened is I just wrote down the wrong matrix. The problem is it's similar. All right, where we wanted to use this matrix. So it should go three, two, zero. Erase, please. All right, three, two, zero. Negative one, one, negative five. And five, three, one. All right, so that is our A matrix. So are there any row reduction questions about what's on the board? So we're expecting one free variable, which we got. So our x3 is free. So one free variable, that means our null space is dimension one. That's the same number of free variables. And we need to find a basis for this. So let's go ahead and write out our x1, x2, x3. So x3 is free. And we'll go with t for x3. So let x3 equals t. So we have x1 minus 8x3 equals 0, so x1 equals 8x3, so x1 will be 8t, and x2 minus 3x3 equals 0, so x2 
equals 3x3. So we got 3t. Can you scroll up for a second? I can definitely scroll up. Is that far enough? Uh, a little bit more. More? Okay. Well, oh, that's good. Okay. Never mind. Because I'm getting I have 1, 0, 2, you have 1, 0, 8. Oh. So who got the answer I got? You already did this one. It was simplified to 1, 0, 2. Oh no, which one? Right here? Ah, my life's work is ruined. So negative five, so we get positive five, positive five, and we have, ooh, no, that row one, that was a mess it up. Then we add a row one, so that should be a Two. We swapped so that two moves here. nodding all right math by democracy it's one thing that doesn't care about democracy it's math all right so this should be our s subspace right here so this is the subspace if I write in set notation we'll use s right here for the subspace s equals I can factor the t out, so we'll go with minus 2, 3, 1 times t, any t, any real number t. So in set notation, it's all multiples of the vector negative 2, 3, 1. All right, so first of all, is this a subspace? Will it have the zero vector inside? How do you get the zero vector? What t value? zero, so that's easy to see. If I add up, so we're gonna check. Check that this is a subspace. So clearly zero is negative two, three, one times zero. So we got zero in there, that's no problem. Uh, can we add two elements in here? So we're gonna check closed under addition, so I'm going to get two vectors in here, so we'll go with uh, V1 and V2 inside S, so V1 will look like negative 2, 3, 1 times some T, so I'll just call this one T1, and then vector 2 is going to look the same, except we'll have its own T value, we'll call it T2. So let's go ahead and add V1 plus V2. What algebra rule am I using here to add these? So I could multiply the T inside of both of these and then do regular addition or I can use a distributive property. So also known as factoring. So I can write it as negative two, three, one times T 
plus T2. So this is inside the set S because T1 plus T2 is a real number. So it's another vector in that set. So we add two vectors, we'll get another vector in the set. And we can check scalar multiplication. So we're going to look at any, we'll go with uh, alpha in R. We're gonna check alpha V1. So that'll be alpha times minus two, three, one, T1. And we're going to just reorder our multiplication. Scalar multiplication, you can reorder. But matrix products, you cannot reorder. So this commutes because we're gonna move commute scalars here. So I can write this as nine, minus two, three, one, times alpha T1. And then we just reassociate, which most of you would say, of course, you can do that last step right there. But I just commuted two right there, the scalar and the vector. And then I reassociated. So there are some invisible parentheses right here that I'll use right out in purple. So. T1 didn't play a role until the last step. So all I did was commute inside the alpha and the vector, and then I reassociated. Now normally you do all these things kind of at the same time. You don't care about associativity because everything's associative and everything's commutative, but we're gonna be a little extra careful because things are not everything is commutative now. So we'll just be a little bit careful when we commute. So we're going to look now at why a null space is always a vector space. So here we saw that this particular null space is a vector space. Now we're going to check why all null spaces are vector spaces. So I'm going to zoom way in because we're getting too far zoomed out here. So we're going to lose what's on the screen. So a null space is a vector space, and we're gonna prove this. So we'll just take N to be the null space of some matrix A. So that means, we'll use V for a vector. So V is in n exactly when a v equals zero. So that's what it means to be in the null space. If you multiply the left by a, your product is zero. So that's what it means to be in the null space. So we're gonna check close under addition. So we're going to take two vectors, we'll go v1, v2 inside n, we're supposed to show v1 plus v2 is still inside n. So all we're going to do is look at what is the product n times the sum v1 plus v2. What algebra, so I can't just say this is zero right away. So let's distribute. So this will be NV1 plus NV2. Now individually, these products have to be zero because they came from the null space. That's what it means to be in the null space. If you multiply the vector by N, you get the zero vector. And you multiply the other vector by N, you get the zero vector again. And of course, what is zero plus zero? Zero. Zero. So we get 
So zero vector. So yes, V1 plus V2 is in the null space. So any questions on proving that? So now we're gonna try scalar multiplication. So we already have V1 is in N, so we're gonna check. So we're gonna take any scalar alpha we want to show that alpha v1 is inside n. So the way we're going to check that, uh-oh, nobody said anything. What is very incorrect and misleading about what's in this box here? I'm multiplying a null space by a vector. Nobody said anything. That should be the letter A right there. It should be the matrix A. N is the null space of A, not the matrix A. So these should all be A's here. Does that mean I messed up on the, no, I have the right thing at the top there. That's what it means to be in the null space. All right, so we're going to multiply this alpha V1 by A. And now we're going to reassociate. The reason we can commute on the next step is why. Why am I allowed to write this as alpha A V1? Because it's a scalar. So scalar multiplication is nice. You can commute scalars, no problem. And we are going to reassociate again. And a v1 is the zero vector. That's what it meant to be in the null space. And so of course, zero vector times any scalar is a zero vector. So we just showed, thus alpha v1 is in v, is in n. Now ready for the fundamental theorem of invertible matrices. fundamental theorems can you remember in math? Fundamental theorem of calculus. Fundamental theorem of algebra. There's also fundamental theorem of arithmetic. All important and mostly forgotten. All right, so it's fundamental, so that means you probably won't remember it. So in this, you do need a square matrix because this is about invertible matrices. And remember, the only kinds of matrices that are invertible are square ones. So only square ones are invertible. So this is about uh, square matrices. So A is an by n matrix. And the following are equivalent. So any of the theorems that say the following are equivalent, that means if one of the statements is true, they're all true. And if one's false, they're all false. So if there's a matrix A that has any of these properties I write down, it has all these properties. And if a matrix A ha does not have one of these properties, it has none of the properties. So this is an all or nothing theorem. So first one, A is invertible. It was invertible I, IBLE or ABLE? A, 
my notes, my handwritten notes say eyeball, and this says able. All right, somebody with a smartphone, be smart. Let's get to the bottom of this, the most pressing issue of the time. Yeah, it's I-B-L-E. It's I-B-L-E. All right, invert eyeball. Eyeball to be inverted. I liked able. All right, so you can have A invertible. That's the same as AX equals B having a unique solution. So if in part B, if we have a unique solution, does that mean we have inconsistent? Inconsistent is no solution. So if you have a unique solution, how many free variables do you have? None. None. So this means one solution, no free variables. So that's what part B says. Part C, AX equals zero, has only the trivial solution. So it is way faster to check C than it would be to check B, because you can't check every matrix, uh, every vector B, but you can set the product equal to zero and look for the trivial solution. So part C is a little faster to test. D, A is row equivalent to I, N. And I, N is the identity matrix here. So that means you can perform row operations on A and you'll get down to ones going down the full diagonal all the way, which of course we know means no free variables and if we're in part C, exactly one solution, which would be the every variable is zero solution. I'm not gonna go back and prove all this. Uh, I'm just gonna talk through a little bit why these are equivalent. So that'll be as far as we're gonna get into uh, the logic of, of why this is true. Part E, A is a product of elementary matrices. So remember how we perform row operations and we reverse the order and the operation and we went from our reduce matrix back to our original. Now if your reduce matrix is the identity, so that would be part D. If I can reduce it to the identity, I can reconstruct my matrix from the row operation, the reverse row operations in reverse order. So that means I could write it as a product of elementary matrices, those row operations in reverse order. So that's how you can go from part D to part E. Now F rank of A equals N. So one way to think about rank, if you take the columns out of the matrix, those columns, the dimension of their uh, sp span will be n. Or that no column is a linear combination of the other columns. So it has full rank. So I'll just write that here, full rank. You can never have a higher rank than your number of columns. So rank basically counts your linear number of linearly independent columns. There's another way to think about rank. Part G, nullality of A equals zero. And remember, nullality was the dimension of the null space of A. So the null dimension will be zero. We did not get that on the last example. In the last example, we got the dimension on null space was one. So the matrix we've been using for the last uh, several examples is not invertible. It is, does not have a unique solution. The rank of the null space is one. So it has none of these properties. Uh, the column vectors of A are independent.
i the column vectors span rn j the column vectors form a basis for rn So H, I, and J, those are all about column vectors, and the next three will all be about row vectors. So part K, row vectors form a basis for Rn. Vectors are linearly independent. And part M, row vectors span R N. So your intuition probably connected some of these before, but here's the complete list right here of what's equivalent. And again, this is only for a square matrix. So you could use this theorem if I ask you if the matrix is invertible and maybe one of these other ones is much easier to show. You could show me maybe that, let's see, your null space is dimension zero, and then you can say, by the fundamental theorem of vertical matrices, FTO, let's get an acronym here, FTOIM. By FTOIM, my matrix is invertible because my null space has uh, dimension zero, or my nullality is zero. So if one of them one of the other ones easier to show, you can show that one and then use theorem and say what you're looking for is this uh, because of the theorem. So our next example showed that one, two, three, minus one, zero, one, and four, nine, seven, form a basis for R3. So we are asked to, this is for R, so that would be part J up here. If I put them into a matrix, that these would be the columns, and I want to show the columns form a basis for R3. <coughs> Which of these up here do you think would be the easiest to show? There's a few that are relatively quick to show. I'd say part C is pretty easy to show right there. We, I think we just did that. Um, what I think is even easier is part D. Can I use row operations and turn it into the identity? That's what you're doing for uh, part C, but without even setting up an equation. It's just straight up row reducing. So let's just, we're gonna show part J by actually proving part D and then saying it's equivalent. So we're gonna prove part J by testing part D. So we're supposed to show A is row equivalent to I3. Show our matrix A, which is 1, 2, 3, minus 1, 0, 1, 4, 9, 7, is row equivalent to the identity matrix. 
right, so perform some row operations and turn our matrix into the identity. Yes, that would definitely be a negative five. Two row one, so that'd be negative seven. Now I could stop here. This is not the identity matrix. Hopefully you've done enough row reduction and know this is going to be the identity in a few more steps. The way that I see this is gonna be the identity, we already have the lower triangle of zeros. I know this one is gonna clear the column and then the two will clear the next column. So that's the way I think about this row operation proceeding. Just think about that. One at the bottom is gonna knock out, entirely knock out column three except the one, and then that two, which we could easily turn to a one, will knock out everything else in column two. So I could keep doing the row operations here, which is what I said I was going to do, so we will keep doing that. Get all this stuff out of my matrix. Maybe it'll disappear. All right, so I will keep reducing, but right here, you could look at this and say there's gonna be exactly one solution to AX equals zero. So with this form, I'm comfortable saying there is exactly one solution to this, and that's a trivial solution. But what I'm gonna do instead is keep going and reduce the identity. like they're going crazy. So we just reduced the identity. And therefore, by the fundamental theorem of invertible matrices, the columns of A span R3. All right, so just because they span R3, is that enough? We're supposed to show it forms a basis. Oh, I don't know why basis. Oh, we did show it forms, forms a basis, Never mind. 
So we don't have to, if all we showed was that they spanned, we'd also have to show independence. But we actually just use that theorem and it said that these vectors form a basis. So the columns of A form a basis for R3. So our next theorem, we'll look at subspaces and um, how we can use a basis of a subspace. So we'll let S be a subspace, a vector subspace. is going to be a, a basis of S. Any vector V in S has a unique linear combo of basis vectors. that make V. So what that means is that V is going to equal, if we use some sigma notation, it will be alpha I, B is a basis of S, so we'll use B I for the basis vectors. And of course this is alpha 1, B 1, plus alpha 2, B 2, plus alpha n, bn. So this is just a linear combination of the basis vectors. So of course it's a basis, so it has to span, but this idea of unique, because our basis vectors have to be linearly independent, there's only one combination that works out. If uh, there was two different linear combinations that worked out, that would mean our basis is not actually independent. That would mean that I could remove one or more vectors and still have a, and still span. So a good way to think about the basis is it's a minimal span. So it spans your vector space and has no extra vectors. So if you throw out any vector, you no longer span. So a basis is a minimal spanning set. And when you have a basis, you can, so this theorem says if you have a basis, you can write any element as a combination of the basis vectors. So the above sequence of coefficients so that would be alpha 1 through alpha n is the coordinates of V with respect to a basis B. And you can look at this product right here. So we'll go and write our So this matrix right here is, its columns are the basis vectors from B. So these are all basis vector columns. And then over here are going to be the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. And the product will work because as we go across, we're going across n columns. And we go down, we're going down 
n rows. So the same number of columns, we will have the same number of rows. So everything will match up. And what we get when we multiply will be that vector v. And one way to look at this product, this will be, uh, if I multiply across and down, we will get, so this will be v right here. So we have, I don't know how many uh, rows we have. So I'll just write m uh, rows. I don't know how tall this matrix is. All I know is how wide it is. So it is definitely n wide. Our second matrix here, our vector is n by one. So when we multiply these together, we're gonna have an m rows by one column. So this matrix will have lots of rows, one column. I'm gonna write this out in a weird way. Our, so it'll be B1 alpha one plus B2 alpha two. So I'm just going across and down. Usually we don't multiply an entire column at a time, but I'm just doing it right here. be an alpha n and that was exactly what our vector v was. So that's a way to write out any element with respect to a particular basis. So I think we just showed we had a basis for R3 with three vectors. So I'm going to write that out. basis will be the 1, 2, 3, and the negative 1, 0, 1, and 4, 9, 7. So we just showed this is a basis for R3. What that means is I can take any vector in R3 and you can find the linear combination that makes that vector. So I can take any vector I want in R3 and you can find a linear combination to make that vector. So I could choose an easy one, like two, four, six. What combination would be two, four, six? I picked this one easy intentionally. First one times two and then zero of the others. So this would be two times one, two, three plus zero, negative one, zero, one, plus four, nine, seven. Oops, times, I put a plus zero in there. All right, so in this basis, we can write out these new coordinates. So this is our coefficient vector right here. 2, 0, 0, is the coordinates of 2, 4, 6 with respect to our basis B. So if we switch bases to this one right here, B, then this 2, 4, 6 using these basis vectors will be two of the first zero of the second, zero of the third. And we're going to call this VB, or two, four, six with a B at the bottom. So what that means is it's the vector two, four, six, but its coordinates are not with a normal basis, but with respect to the basis B. So that's a little bit strange. So let's do a less easy example. So we'll let W equal so I could really pick anything. Let's go twelve zero seven. 
That should be fine. All right, so I want you to find the coordinates of W with respect to the basis B. So you're going to find W with respect to B. So what you're going to do, so it's the same as finding alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, such that W is 12, 0, 7 equals alpha 1 times our first basis vector, which is 1, 2, 3, plus alpha 2, negative 1, 0, 1, plus alpha 3 times 4, 9, 7. Now I just made this problem up, so there's a decent chance the fractions might be a little annoying. So when you're doing your row operations, try to push off fractions as long as you can. At some point, I can almost guarantee you there'll be some ugly fractions creeping in, because I just made it up. All right, so I'll give you a minute head start to ask any questions you got. All right, time to go. All right, I guess we'll finish this tomorrow.